Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the last monthly colloquium of this semester. So we have a wonderful speaker uh, today. Um, so our speaker today is uh, Jay Kumar uh, Radhakrishnan um, from the School of Technology and uh, Computer Science. Um, and of course, one of our own at ICPS. Um, so he works on lots of interesting things like uh, quantum information, quantum computing, complexity theory. Uh, and today the topic is entropy, which I think a lot of us believe we understand. And there's a famous quotation by von Neumann that says, nobody really understands what entropy is. So hopefully by the end of the talk, we are illuminated, but I guess we can already see whatever entropy is, it's what counts. So with that, Jack. Thank, thank you for uh, the invitation to speak at uh, this colloquium. And uh, uh, thank you all for coming. So I'm a theoretical computer scientist. So uh, I'll try to tell you uh, what uh, I think about when I say entropy. Uh, it is roughly what uh, is used in certain areas of probability. And uh, then we'll see some applications of entropy. Okay. So, yeah. uh, so please uh, ask questions whenever something is not clear. And also, I believe there are people I hope there are people online and there is some protocol for them to interrupt. So, all right. Uh, so I'll just start with some problems and then we will see. Okay. So we have some points in three dimensions, n of them. Okay. And when we project them down, we get n1 points. So why do we not get all n points? because some of them are located one top on top of the other. So when they project, we get only N1 different distinct projections on the XY plane. And when we project in this direction, we get N2. And when we project in this direction, we get N3. And the Loomis-Whitney inequality says that N1 times N2 times N3 is always at least N squared. Yeah. N was the number of points here. And N1, N2, and N3 were the number of points that were created in these three projections. So N1 times N2 times N3 is at least N squared. Now, I see most people are probably physicists here. So, yeah, so whether such an inequality should be interesting at all. Uh, so, uh, yeah, let me just use one physics principle that I still remember. Uh, so suppose these were volumes, then, uh, yeah, so you measure volume in meter cube. So the right-hand side is like meter to the power six. Yeah. And these are meter squared, meter squared, meter squared. Again, meter to the power six, at least the dimensions are interesting. Yeah. They're both meter to the power six. I'm just joking. Yeah. So such an inequality ought to be interesting. Okay. But why is this inequality? Uh, true, what's going on? I can't do anything. Yeah, okay. So, no, worst case, whenever endpoints are given and you project them like this, you get uh, N1 times yeah, so I don't know something is wrong with my, let me just uh, come back. Yeah, so the, yeah. So the question is, why is this true question? Suppose you had a general basis that was not all belong. Yeah. Would something like this still be true? Yeah, so it would still be true. Yeah, if it formed a basis in a certain sense. Yeah, and the whole point, I would like to convince you that this is, not a problem in geometry at all. It's a problem of information. Okay. And let me try. Okay. So if you take a point here, again, uh, yeah, and you project it. So this point is X, Y, and Z. It has three coordinates, X, Y, and Z. And you project it down 
you get x y you project it this way you get y z and you project it this way into on the x z plane so you get x z yeah now uh, from a computer scientist point of view when you want to specify one among n things you need log n bits of information okay so it looks like the amount of information whatever that means we'll get to that there is about log n bits of information here there is some amount of information here some amount of information here some amount of information that we are getting by looking at the three projections but the amount of information here is at most log n1 bits yeah because there are only n1 possibilities and at most n2 possibilities and n3 possibilities but notice that for every piece of information here i am receiving it from two sources yeah x coordinate i am getting it from here as well as here so it ought to be that the amount of information in these three put together is two times the information here okay so one would say yeah obviously log n1 plus log n2 plus log n3 must be at least two log n because log n is the amount of information here and whenever one uses obviously in an argument <laughs> uh, yeah is one should wonder yeah so that's uh, yeah so why is it this work in general dimension yes uh, actually the lumis whitney inequality is a statement about general dimension okay yeah so yeah in arbitrary d dimensions this works yeah. but uh, the point is that i have somehow tried to think about this in the language of information every piece of information that leads to my determining the point p is available from two sources hence the information in these three should together add up to two times this two is because of that yeah. okay so now question it's not a problem that the two sources are not necessarily yes yeah so they are not necessarily independent yes yeah, so those things will come but uh, right now i'm just saying that the amount of information by that i get by picking a point p is log n bits that information is available from two sources information goes as the log of the number of possibilities hence this inequality must be true yeah yeah and i mean right now it is just a religious belief uh, one shouldn't question it too much yeah. okay yeah. so what will happen is that we will define a notion called entropy okay yeah which you know of course but i will abuse that notion so when you pick a point p uniformly at random so i am now throwing probability there was no probability in the original problem yeah so now you pick a point p uniformly at random and then it will turn out that when a point is picked uniformly at random from a certain set its entropy is log of the number of elements in that set in that set so the entropy of p will be log n yeah and i will somehow define entropy so yeah that's what i wrote here the entropy of the point p is log n and the entropy of each of these points will be at most log n1 log n2 and log n3 respectively yeah question here you are using finite size everything is finite at the moment i to make, keep people interested i mentioned volume and there is there are versions of this theorem which work for volumes actually the lumis whitney inequality is about volumes in space so you take a volume look at its shadow here shadow here and shadow there and multiply those shadows in as volumes in their ambient n minus 1 dimensional space and then multiply them but we'll get yeah so right now i'm discrete for the whole talk we will just be talking about discrete sets so what will happen is that there will be so here is the point p and p consists of three pieces of information x y and z and x y and z need not be independent yeah i mean it depends on the way the points are arranged yeah in any case this entropy can be expanded just as you expand probabilities except that since we are working with logs instead of products you get plus signs okay so entropy of x y z will be entropy of x plus entropy of y given x how, how much information do you learn from knowing y once you already know x okay and entropy of z given xy 
how much information do you learn? Sorry, when I write x, y here, please don't think of it as x multiplied by y. It is x and y kept left next to each other. So entropy of z given x, y, yeah? How much information do you learn? So this is an equality that we'll be able to write for our notion of entropy, whatever it is going to turn out to be. And similarly, we can expand these quantities. Yeah, and now let us add this, this, these three quantities and compare it with h of p. h of x does appear twice. h of y given x appears as h of y given x on the right hand side, but once it appears as h of y. Now, at least our intuition of entropy should say that this is amount of information that I learned from knowing y after I know x, this is amount of information in y itself. So the amount of information in y ought to be greater than the entropy of y given x. Yeah, believe everything I say. Yeah. Similarly, this term is dominated by these. Terms. So if all these equations work out, then we are slightly, I mean, you, closer to what we want to prove as a proof. Then log n1 plus log n2 plus log n3 is greater than or equal to this. And it looks like by inspection, this sum is greater than h of p. And h of p is log n by design because we picked the point p uniformly at random. Okay, So the point p was picked uniformly at random and various points p1, p2, p3 arose. Yeah? p1, p2, p3 need not be uniform in their particular domains because it could be that one point has many points above it the other point has only few. Then when we project, it won't be uniform distribution here. Okay, yeah, so that's addressing this point. And we will get this inequality, okay? And we'll be able to say that it is entropy that counts. <laughs> okay, good. What's happening? I don't know why it gets stuck each time. Yeah, so it's possible to, uh, 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 yeah, figure out when entropy, uh, equality holds. Yeah, but certainly if you had a cuboid with eight points and uh, each of the projections would be four points, and essentially this is the sort of cases when equality holds. So all that I said previously with the formula H, H stood for entropy of a random variable. Okay, it turns out that all those e things hold for something called Shannon entropy. Again, many of you know about this. I'm just uh, saying it as if pretending that you don't. Okay. So what is Shannon entropy? Suppose you have a random variable X, which can take R outcomes. Yeah? It can take R values, A1 to AR, and these are the corresponding probabilities. Okay. Then the entropy of this random variable is this quantity. P1 log 1 over P1, P2 log 1 over P2, PR log 1 over PR. Okay. And this was introduced in a famous paper of Shannon and the mathematical theory of communication, I think in 1948. And it has the following properties uh, that the entropy of uh, the random variable which has r possibilities is at most log r and the equality holds when this is uniform distribution each of these quantities is one over r which you can directly check okay and if you take some variable random variable and pass it through a function the amount of information cannot increase yeah this is a deterministic function so h of f of x is less than or equal to h of x okay so this is so I'll tell you a few more things about Shannon entropy, and then we will see an application. Yeah. So we saw one application already, yeah. Yeah. which was the Loomis-Whitney inequality. Okay. So the whole point of this is that you can, once you get some facility with these notions of entropy, then you can sit back and start believing inequalities just based on the notion of information. Okay. So, 
Any, it's a, some no, any function. Uh, so let me try and explain. So uh, suppose uh, X is a random person in this room and F of X is the color of their shirt. Okay. So F of X is the random variable, which is just various distributed over the set of colors. And X is distributed over the set of people. Okay. So that means perhaps multiple possibilities have been collapsed into a single possibility. Yeah. Two different persons having the same shirt. Now their probabilities will add up and become the color. It will get attached to the color. This sort of collapsing only um, reduces entropy. And it is because this function x log x is a convex. So there is convexity going on, but the f itself, f can be anything. Yeah, yeah. So this is h of. Now, if you have two random variables, x and y, they may have some joint distribution. They need not be independent. For example, a person and the person's color. Yeah, so in this case, they are obviously not independent because once you know the person, you know their, the color of their shirt. Okay. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. So can I just think of it as f of x is like, so you have a set of random variable and then you are basically constructing another set of variable by this function f. And you're looking at the entropy for that set of random variables. Is it that one? Yeah. So you actually have only one random variable x and you are losing some information about it when you compute f. Yeah. And I'll like, okay. No, what I'm saying is, can I just think of it like a, from a... Suppose this x initially that random variable is drawn from a uniform distribution between zero and one. Yes. And f of x can be a log function which gives me a distribution, exponential distribution. That's right. So the right? it doesn't remain uniform anymore. Yeah, exactly. That's right. So certain things collapse and they may not, may not collapse, um, you know, uniformly, even if they collapse uniformly. Yeah. So suppose okay. you had 100, 100 people. And the first 10 of them, you collapse into a single mm -hmm. next time. Then it does become uniform distribution, but only mm -hmm. 10 possibilities. Mm -hmm. Whereas the original thing was uniform distribution on 100 possibilities. A uniform distribution on 100 possibilities has entropy log 100. Whereas this collapsing makes it only log 10. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you. Okay, so there is, so I said, uh, yeah, so treat x, y as a single entity, then for each possible outcome i, j for x and y, you have a probability and you just apply the Shannon's formula to this. Nothing has happened. Okay. Conditional entropy. Uh, now, I want to say what is the entropy of x given y? Yeah. And here's the formula. Okay. But this particular formula has a certain interpretation similar to what we study about conditional probability itself. So X can, sorry, here, this is conditional entropy of X given Y. So Y has many possibilities. Yeah. And those possibilities occur according to the probability, the, what's it called? The margin, the marginal distribution of Y. Yeah. So Y can take various possibilities. And once, Y has taken a possibility B1, X takes various values based on the conditional distribution. Now, each of these conditional distributions has its own probability, uh, whole entropy. Now, you have a little entropy inside each of these subtrees corresponding to the conditional distribution there. You just take their average based on these probabilities. And that, it turns out, is the same thing as this. This is just jugglery with formulas. Okay. So once on an average, how much information, uh, how much entropy does X retain after Y has been fixed? Okay. That is declared to be the entropy of X given Y. Okay. That is our formula. And this entropy of X given Y is never more than the entropy of X. And this needs to be proved again because some function is convex, okay? This is true, okay? But 
once we have proved this, we can enjoy its benefits, which we did when we proved the loomis brittany inequality. We said conditional entropy can be no more than the entropy itself. Okay, so yeah. now there's also something called mutual information. That is how much information is common between these two random variables when these two random variables have a joint distribution, okay? It's given by this formula. When we need to use it, I will tell you more about it, okay? But it exists and, uh, you know, it was here in this picture. So I thought I should tell you. Okay. So, all right, we had something called an entropy of a random variable. We made use of it to prove a combinatorial or a geometric inequality where randomness or information did not a priori, you know, make an entrance. So I would like to now tell you how briefly uh, where entropy and communication uh, are related. I'm assuming that some of you are not aware of this. Okay. So imagine that X and Y are like this. They have some, uh, I'm sorry, there is no Y. There's just X and X is a random variable, which has its own distribution. So we know it's R outcomes and the probability for each of the R outcomes. And here's the party A, which gets to see X, but it needs to communicate X to the party B. Yeah? Sometimes they're called Alice and Bob, it doesn't matter. So Alice sees X and wants to tell Bob what X is. But in the beginning, Alice and Bob know that X has a certain distribution. That is, it will be the color red with a certain probability, blue with a certain probability, yellow with a certain probability. But it's only Alice who's going to see the color and she wants to tell Bob. Now, they try to communicate by sending symbols zero and one. Okay, so each of these outcomes is encoded, yeah, with strings of zeros and ones. And their goal is to design this encoding so that the cost of communication is as small as possible. So what would they do? Things which have high probability, they would like to assign them shorter code words because they don't, on an average, they want the cost of communication to be low. Very rare events, we can give them long strings. Things which are very popular, which happen very often, you give them short strings. Okay. So, question. How do you define number of symbols? Number of symbols. So, once again, yeah. So, let us say that blue will be 0, 0, 001, red will be 0, 0, 0, 0, 001, green will be just one and so on. So when Alice sees blue, she will transmit 001. And on seeing 001, um, sorry, what am I doing? Bob will be able to decode it using this chart and determine that Alice intended to send blue, okay? And this length, three in this case, is the cost of transmitting blue. And when green appears, you get away by sending only one bit. So things which have very high probability here, we would like to give them shorter strings. Things that have low probability here, we can afford to give them longer strings. Yeah. And there should be no error. Bob should be able to decode perfectly. And then we can ask, what is the best scheme given these probabilities for transmission? And let me define that for the best scheme to be T of X, the transmission cost of this random variable X. When one person sees X, how many bits must they transmit in order for the other person to know X, okay? And what sort of encoding that should they first negotiate so as to minimize this cost? And it turns out that this cost is very closely related to the entropy of the random variable, okay? That is, it is always at least the entropy and it is, there are schemes where you will get by by sending at most h of x plus one bits, okay? So in this, this sort of reinforces our notion 
that the formula that Shannon had corresponds to information, uh, information, at least in this operational sense, in this engineering sense, amount of bits I need to send in order to communicate X is the information in X. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, yeah. So let me, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so yes, yeah, so let me explain the chronology. Yes. So first, Alice and Bob, they study the problem and they realize this is the probability distribution. Then they sit together and build this dictionary. Then they are separate. Alice happens to have the instrument which can detect the color. She transmits the color over some communication channel to Bob. Communication channel makes no errors. Yeah, Bob should be able to decode the color. Expectation, I'm sorry. Yeah, so you, this E, I know. Uh, yeah, actually in physics, E means many things. Yeah, so uh, this E is taking the expectation over the choices of Y. Yeah. Yeah, otherwise, yeah, probably that's why they didn't choose E for H, entropy either. By that time, he was taken. <laughs> Question. Sorry. T of X is the minimum over all such encodings. That has a certain cost. Yes. And now, so this is fixed. Okay. Now. Alice and Bob come up with a certain encoding and they compute what is the cost of that encoding. Then they come up with a different encoding. Then they compute the cost. Among all such encodings, find the one which has minimum expected cost. It is, how is T? Probability of P blue times three. Probability of red times five plus probability of green times one expected length of communication. Yeah. So you, uh, uh, yeah, just one. you pay one rupee for each bit you transmit. Okay. Yeah. So it's not like a law. No, no, no. This is a, this is just a bit string. It's a sequence of symbols for each symbol you transmit, you pay one rupee. Yeah. And you would like on average to keep your cost low question. H of X, H of X is a numerical value obtained by um, this formula. H of X plus one is a numerical value. It may not be an integer or anything, but it is some value. And T of X, which is also a numerical value, is sandwiched between this and this. Questions? I'm going slower than expected, yeah. <laughs> but doesn't matter. Please, please don't worry. Yeah. I mean, the speaker of the next talk is here. So. <laughs> okay, so all this is uh, very nice, uh -huh. but imagine that we were actually tossing the coin. Yeah. So here is a coin which is completely fair. It has two possibilities, and uh, one of them is zero, the other is one, by head or tail. Yeah, and each has probability 0.5. Here is a biased coin which comes up head with probability 0.75 and tail, which one was head? I don't know. One of them with prob head with probability 0.25, tail with probability 0.75. Okay, good. Now, if you apply Shannon's formula and compute the entropy, this is half log half plus half log one over half plus half log one over half. Logs are to the base two. The answer is one. If you do that for this, you get 0.81, blah, 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 but you get 0.81. Now, what is entropy counting in this case? Because if you want to transmit the outcome here, well, for head and tail, you have to send something if no error has to be made. So in both these cases, the transmission cost is one. Yeah, you have to send one bit to the other person. Okay, so somehow entropy doesn't the transmission cost the story that I made here, yeah, doesn't seem to actually count anything 
uh, it is a formula, okay? But it turns out that we can make practical sense of entropy even for coin tosses. And I'll briefly mention that now, okay? So, so far things are fine, yeah? I have told you what entropy is, it has a certain formula, yeah? And I told you conditional entropy, I made, a, made use of it. And I said there is some engineering reason to respect entropy. So, yeah, what does entropy count? So, if right. question. Yeah, there are only two possibilities, and some, yeah, so when there are la large number of possibilities and the probabilities are somewhat well distributed among them, the transmission cost might form a good motivation for studying entropy. But in situations like this, the motivation that I have presented so far is slightly flaky, maybe not fully convincing. So I'm hoping that the next uh, motivation I give you uh, convinces you better. Question. Sorry, between this and this? Uh, the equality will probably be there if this R happens to be a power of two and this is uniform distribution, some special circumstances like that. Yes, many, yeah. Yes, if they are independent, it will be n times the entropy of one. Yeah, but it is, if you have, so maybe I should, yeah. If you have many coin tosses and you are trying to transmit them, yeah, it's not a good idea to transmit each outcome, yeah? It is better to do what's called delayed live. You look at all your possibilities and then you assign it a code. You don't code individual bits, okay? Uh, it, will, it will become apparent very soon. So imagine that you have tossed this coin, either this coin or this coin. So either we have a coin which is unbiased or we have a coin which is biased and we have tossed it n times. Okay. Now, if you have an unbiased coin, the possibilities can be any pattern of zeros and ones, zero, zero, head, 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 or tail, 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 or half heads, first half heads, the next half tails. All of them have probability one over two to the n. Yes. Whereas if you have a biased coin, then the all ones sequence has probability 0.75 times 0.75 times 0.75, whereas the all zero sequence has probability 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25. So if the number of outcomes in both cases is two to the n, but in this case, it is uniformly distributed. Whereas in this case, it is sort of heavy towards the top. Strings which have more ones, more ones, they become heavier. So, let us ask, essentially, suppose I wanted to collect a probability half. So there are these two to the n possibilities. Out of them, I want to collect enough strings so that I get a significant amount of probability. Okay. Now, in this case, all strings have probability 1 over 2 to the n. If you want to get half the probability, you have to take half the strings. So the number of strings you need is growing like 2 to the n. In this case, if you want to get a good amount of probability. Whereas in this case, you know that there is going to be concentration on strings which have about 0.75n. If you toss coins, yeah, and you each coin can come up head with probability 0.75, and you toss many, many coins, roughly 75% of the coin tosses will result in a one. In which case, you have only a fewer number of strings. And if you ask, how many essential probability possibilities do you have? It turns out that it turns out to be two to the 0.81. And this 0.81 is, is the entropy that I had on the previous slide. Okay. So let me explain this in general. If you have a random variable X and you are doing N independent samples from them and you get this sequence, yeah, and you look at its probability, so there are various sequences. How many sequences are there in this? 
r to the power n each outcome yeah each experiment is going to result in one of r possibilities and you are performing this experiment n times so there are r to the power n possibilities some of them are likely some of them probably have zero probability because maybe one of these pi's is zero okay so there are things like this which have zero probability there are things like this which have low probability there are things like this that have probably high probability okay now your question is find the smallest set of strings so that their total probability is at least epsilon think of epsilon as half okay and you take the log of that number and divide by n and take the limit as n tends to infinity and this quantity is the entropy of the original random variable this one yes yeah, so you had an original random variable x you conducted this experiment by tossing it again and again by yeah by looking at x independently again and again yeah? and look at the outcome possibilities and try to collect enough so that they have significant probability and it turns out that that number goes as 2 to the power something times n and that something is entropy okay the number of possibilities grows as 2 to the power something and that something is entropy okay so what is interesting is that we don't count all outcomes because impossible outcomes we leave aside we don't even count all positive probabilities because as we saw if we in this example if we counted all things with positive probability we would have had to take everything because everything has positive probability but we take enough so that we have substantial probability okay and you take such a set of smallest size which can capture enough probability and see its size the way it grows with n and it turns out that the exponent there now looking at these words not all outcomes all outcomes with positive probabilities probability at least epsilon i was somehow reminded of something which is not showing up i don't know what's going on with this presentation sorry no Oh. I'm sorry this is a shame. Yeah. One second. Let me try again. Ah, maybe. It's going to sleep. Yeah. Okay, sorry you realize why I'm So 1948. Yeah. Shannon wrote a paper and in 1947 maybe yeah on the other side of the globe uh, these three phrases were uttered or found utterance yeah not wholly or in full measure but substantially and today is the 14th of november okay so i don't know yeah <laughs> sorry yeah it was not a serious comment <laughs> so back to combinatorics yeah so you understand uh, the entropy shows up when we try to um, study what happens when we perform the experiment again and again question it's a sort of a prediction if we have more than uh, two out of two observations this time because we have more out of the prediction you have of, uh, of this particular high probability volume or whatever yeah. will it always be sort of a one shot Or can it be yeah. Are yeah. So, yeah, first of all, you know, I am in the discrete world, so everything is bunched up into little things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, close to use each other. So, what will happen is that we know that when we toss, when we perform an experiment again and again, the probability concentrates on typical sequences. That is, out of n things. p1 times n will look like a1 so suppose these were colors and i perform this experiment many many times there will be a proportion p1 of blues p2 of reds p3 plus or minus square root n yeah and it turns out so in the end you are taking this multinomial coefficient how many ways are there to choose p1 ns out of p1 n blues p2 n reds p3 n greens out of n and you take a log of that and 
take divide by n, take n going to infinity, all those other tiny terms, yeah, they get washed away because you are dividing by n and taking logs. Yeah. Now your question was, do they get bunched up? There will be a notion of typical sequences, which will be like this, the layer where typicality happens and most of the probability will be there. Yeah. Uh, in terms of volume, if the same thing can be done for continuous distributions, it will be, uh, it, yeah, so it, it will essentially be one solid volume. I believe so, but I, I, I no, it, uh, okay, let me not comment right now. Okay, yeah, let, I need to think that through. Epsilon dependence is always a factor. So it turns out that no matter which epsilon you choose, the quantity you will get will always be h of x. And um, yeah, if you choose epsilon very small, maybe you will have to take n much larger for this for you to approach the limit. This is the usual mathematics games. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. So here's the problem. Uh, so I'm trying to give you another example question. Yeah. So uh, I don't think so. I think this is just this is just uh, law of numbers. That's all. Yeah. And binomial coefficients. Yeah. Yeah. Base, yeah, so if you decided to define your entropy using a different base, then you will, so base, base two comes because Shannon was interested in communication using bits. Yeah, so oh, this log I defined to be log to the base two. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, computer scientist. Yeah. So everywhere where you see a log, for today, log is to the base two. Okay. So, all right. Um, yeah, I'm thinking whether I'll just tell you the problem and uh, maybe I will not go through the example. The point is that you, we were talking about a certain combinatorial problem where you had a set and we wanted to estimate the size of the set and the size of the set used to be N and we found an upper bound on the size of the set. Okay, that is n squared is at most n1 times n2 times n3. Okay, but entropy can also be used to show a lower bound on the size of the set. Okay, and this example was supposed to describe that. But let me tell you what the example is. Suppose you have a graph like this, a collection of nodes connected by edges. Yeah, and every node has exactly d neighbors. Okay, now the question is. How many ways are there to walk in this graph? Yeah, um, for R steps. Okay. So the first vertex you can choose in N ways. And then you take a first step, you have D possibilities. And then wherever you are, you have again D possibilities. You can retrace, you can go back also. Yeah. So it's N times D to the power R is the number of possibilities. And this is exact. Okay. Now, suppose all the vertices don't have the same degree, but their average degree is this d bar. Okay, so suppose the graph has totally the same number of edges, but they are not equally distributed among the vertices. Some vertices have a lot of edges, some vertices have fewer edges. And then I ask in this graph, how many walks are possible of R steps? And it turns out that the number of walks will be at least these many, okay? And there is a very appealing proof based on entropy considerations, yeah? So you can set up a certain random walk on this graph and there is a stationary distribution of that random walk. And if you compute the entropy of that stationary distribution, it turns out to yield this number, okay? So let me not uh, do this because I'm, running out of time. And let me move on. Uh, meaning uh, uh, from a given vertex, so averaged over vertices. Yeah. 
So it will, yeah, so it basically, we would like to know that if I put uniform distribution on one walk, all walks, and then I conditioned on the fact that the first vertex was this, what is the conditional entropy of the walk given this? That is also possible to estimate, yeah. So it, yeah. But here it is just that, yeah, this formula, otherwise, if you need to prove such a thing, all kinds of you have to mess with convexity and various, you have to dirty your hands. But having done the hard work of you know, showing that conditional entropy is less than entropy, the rest of it just follows effortlessly. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm not able to give this in detail, but you can ask me later. So mutual information. Um, I, so what is the mutual information between two random variables? Okay. So it is so it's denoted by i of x colon y. It is entropy of x plus entropy of y minus the entropy of x and y. So suppose x and y were independent. Yeah. Then knowing x gives you no information about y because y is has a life of its own. In that case entropy of x, y will turn out to be entropy of x plus entropy of y, okay? And this will cancel out and you will get zero. So it conforms to our uh, intuition that when x and y are independent, then knowing x, there should be no information, uh, mutual information should be zero, yeah? And there are alternative formulas for entropy, uh, mutual information, which just, goes by expanding this either by x first, yeah, writing entropy of x first or entropy of y first, and then writing the other term as conditional entropy. Yeah. So maybe for some of you, this picture might be useful. So this somehow is x, this somehow is y, don't take it too seriously. And this is the common information. So the common information is that this plus this minus the union, yeah, somehow, yeah, but don't. Okay, so there is also, just like I said that there was entropy had an operational information. How many bits do you need to transmit? There is a similar game that you can set up between Alice and Bob. Alice receives X, but she doesn't want to tell Bob. She wants Bob to independently generate a Y, which has the same conditional distribution as specified by the original distribution of X and Y. And what is the amount of transmission that Alice needs to yeah, do in order for Bob to know why, okay? If X and Y were independent, yeah? Alice has got, received a value of X. She, he, she wants Bob to generate Y. Bob says, don't tell me anything. My Y is supposed to be anyway independent of X. I can generate it myself. I don't need to know your value of X for me to be able to generate Y because Y is independent of X. So in that case, the amount of transmission from Bob will be zero, yeah? This works for other examples. But yeah, never mind. Good. So, computer science. Okay, so I want to now show you an example where mutual information is used in understanding what is called communication complexity. Okay, so if you've not been listening this far or you've lost me, this is yeah, a good time to start. But in the meanwhile, if you have questions of a general nature uh, about what we have said so far, yeah, please ask. So yeah, what have I said? I have told you about entropy. I've given you an example of entropy and I have given you multiple reasons why entropy can be said to count. Okay, so here is Alice. She has a string X of N bits. Bob has a string of N bits. Yeah, so our library has a copy of, I don't know, Encyclopedia Britannica and the library in Bombay has a copy of Encyclopedia Britannica. And they need to check whether their books, the two copies are identical. How, what protocol should they do? Turns out you can't do anything. You just have to send every bit over to the other side. And if you want to do this deterministically, um, you have to send n bits, okay? And the reason is, okay, so let, yeah, I'll let you think about it. The point is, 
that try all possible strings, there are two to the n possible strings, give Alice and Bob the same string. Give Alice 0, 0, 0 and Bob 0, 0, 0. And if they have a protocol, just observe what they sent. And let me call that the transcript. So keep track of the transcript whenever Alice and Bob receive the same input. There are two to the n possible inputs. Alice can be given 0, 0, 0. Bob can be given 0, 0, 0. Alice can be given 1, 1, 1, 1. Bob can be given 1, 1, 1. In each case, a certain pattern of bits were exchanged. Okay, keep track of this. My claim is that for each of the inputs, this pattern has to be different. Because if for 0, 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1, 1, the pattern of communication was the same, then I will give Alice 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1, 1. And neither of them will notice that the other person's input is not the same because they were supposed to follow the same pattern anyway. Okay, and they will get a wrong answer. Okay, so that is, I mean, this sort of this uh, standard computer science adversarial argument, which shows that you need n bits of communication to solve this problem of determining if two strings are identical between two parties. But suppose they are allowed to toss coins. And, uh, uh, but given the deterministic case, yeah. uh, if you knew more information about what the string was, then it that's right. So suppose this x was not distributed over all two to the power n strings. Mm -hmm. They knew that their first bit was anyway going to be the name of the publisher, zero. <laughs> yeah. In which case they won't send the first bit. Yeah. So if they knew that their inputs came from a smaller domain, they can tailor their protocol to do this. Right now, the problem is over all n bit strings, zero, one to the power n. Okay. So now it turns out that with randomness and if you allow yourself a small probability of error let's say i'm allowed to err with probability one over 100 okay then there are protocols where even if they are trying to compare n bit strings just log n bits of communication is enough okay it might look paradoxical but i'll let you think about it yeah and let me move on to a related question where information Place. Yeah, so the, the right now I said one over 100. So there will be a one over epsilon squared, is, or uh, sorry, uh, maybe log one over epsilon. Yeah, log one over epsilon. So as epsilon becomes smaller and smaller, your communication has to increase if you want. And yeah, and when you get to certainty, you have to send n bits. So I'm sorry, I'm, everybody is probably tired, but I really want to tell you this. Okay. So here's a question. Uh, Alice and Bob have n bit strings, and they want to find out if there is a position where they both have ones. The earlier question was, is there a position where we differ? Yeah. They're not interested in, to know whether they differ. Is there a position where we both have ones? Yeah. So imagine that this is actually an encoding of a set. So yeah, here are two important people, and this is their calendar. These ones correspond to the days on which they are free. They have a slot free, and they want to have a meeting. And this is Bob's calendar. This is Alice's calendar. Is there a slot where they are both available? This is the question they want to determine. Yeah, Alice is sitting somewhere. Bob is sitting somewhere. Alice has an n-bit calendar, and Bob has an n-bit calendar, meaning slots. And they have both marked which days they have other uh, commitments. And now they want to find out if there is a slot free for them to. Okay. Now, if they want to solve this problem, yeah, it turns out that deterministically they still need n bits of communication. Now. A very similar problem, it looked like randomness was of great help. Yeah, the moment we allowed some small amount of error, we could reduce the amount of communication from n to just uh, log n. No, oh, the first occurrence where they have a one, maybe some in, in Bob's input and something else in Alice's input. First uh, common one. Huh, first common one. So it will be necessarily less than n. 
uh, how? So, uh, so in the worst case, it could be that they all had zeros, and the first position where they had ones is one. Worst case communication. Yeah, but uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, I would have, I would have then written n over two or something. Yeah, but it's not that uh, crucial. Yeah. Yeah. So in the worst case, they start comparing their uh, calendars from the top, and it could be the last bit where they. So this was a pretty challenging problem in computer science in the 1980s, yeah? until Kalyana Sudram and Schnitger showed that actually, even if you allow randomness, you have to transmit n bits. Again, there is a constant in front of n, which I did not write. Okay. And later on, a proof was given by Rasborov, uh, which was much simpler than this one. This one used Kolmogorov complexity, Rasborov used entropy, but around 2000, uh, really remarkable proof of this fact that randomness does not help for this problem. Even if you're allowed to toss coins, you will have to transmit n bits, yeah? was discovered. And it is that proof that I want to tell you. Now, this problem has also been studied in the quantum model. yeah, and it turns out that if you are allowed quantum communication, then you can get away with square root n bits. Okay. And it, square root n bits is optimal. And again, Rasborov proved this. Yeah. So what I want to do in the five minutes uh, is to tell you how this proof goes. It will all be very superficial and uh, but yeah, I just want to tell you. Yeah. So what is a protocol? Yeah. What, what happens? So Alice has an input X and Bob has his input Y. These are objects like this. They're calendars. Looking at the calendar, they start with some bits. Let's say initially it is all zeros. Alice does some transformation to those bits. This is her memory. Yeah. So her computer memory. She does some operations on her memory and sends off M1 of those bits to Bob. This is the message. This is the first message that Bob has received. Bob, based on the memory that he has, his own local computer, and the message that has just been received from Alice, applies a certain operation according to the protocol. This could be randomized. There is green inside. And sends off some message to this. And this continues for some k rounds. And in the end, Bob says, I declare that we do have a date in common. This is what a protocol is schematically. This is what it looks like. Now, let us define transcript. So if you have an input X and Y, you give Alice X, give Bob Y, and then ask, what is the sequence of messages that went through? Yeah, And you just concatenate, record those messages, and that is called the transcript. And it turns out that we can give Alice and Bob various distributions of inputs. And since we will measure how much information about the input of Alice is this transcript sending, Con how much information does the transcript contain about Alice's input? And suppose this total communication was very short, n over 100. Yeah? Then it will turn out that there is a particular coordinate which they are both neglecting. Okay, so let me just explain this. And yeah, so using properties of mutual information, we will be able to say the following that is, we can provide Alice an input of this kind. What do I mean by this kind? Some bits are completely random to so we are giving her a random calendar where these bits are completely random, these bits are fixed to zero, and this bit is what is of interest to us. In Bob, it is the opposite. These bits are completely zero, and these bits are random. Okay. Now, whether they have a common position where they have both ones is entirely dependent on this. Because here, whether it is one or zero, this fellow has a zero. And here, whether this is one or zero, this has a zero. The common ones don't live there. But these are somewhat distractions which the original protocol had to bear with and as a result, it is neglecting this coordinate. Okay, so these words like neglect, etc. Yeah, later on we will justify. I mean, it, they can be justified, 
using the notion of entropy. And it will turn out that this very same protocol, the messages are hardly sending any information about the bit there. There is a coordinate which they are neglecting. So if the original protocol was very stingy, then there must be a coordinate. There must be a particular slot in Alice and Bob's calendars that that protocol is neglecting. Okay, No matter how they do the encoding. And so they will be wrong for that input where I keep that as the only day when they could have possibly met. Okay, And this is how the argument somehow ends. And you can show that if your um, protocols, your messages carry very little information about some coordinate, then the protocol must make a lot of error. Okay. Now, it turns out that this particular style of argument generalizes to quantum communication. So what is quantum communication? The same thing, except Alice and Bob apply unitary operations. So here are some registers. The initial state is this quantum state. And Alice and Bob, they apply a unitary operation to their subsystem. So this could be the total number of photons could be, say, T. Out of them, T1 bits, T1 photons are with Alice. Alice applies a unitary operation on them and sends off M1 of them to Bob. Then Bob applies some unitary jointly on the bits that he had from before and this and sends off and this and this and this. And in the end, Bob performs a measurement on one of the photons and declares the answer. This is a quantum proto protocol. And the question is, if you are allowed unitary operations instead of stochastic operations, which is what random computation is, unitary versus unitary matrices versus stochastic matrices, then can you get away with shorter messages? Yeah. The message corresponds to the dimension of the space. Of, so if you send k photons over, it is 2 to the power k. I mean, yeah, each photon can be polarized vertically, horizontally, or something like that. Yeah. Now, it turns out that, as many of you know, we can think of density matrices of these states and compute their entropy. And their entropy is given by a formula which is very similar to Shannon's formula, and it is called the von Neumann entropy. Okay, And you can also define a notion of mutual information. Here, x is classical information. Rho is a quantum uh, density matrix, and they live in a joint system. And you can define just like this is E still the expectation. Yeah? And we use S for entropy. So it is similar to this notion. And we would like to do the same argument. I didn't understand what was the density matrix. Row of? Yeah. yeah. So right now, I'm just telling you what von Neumann entropy is and what mutual information is. So suppose you have classical information. And for each outcome here, 0, 0, 0, there is a particular quantum state. Yeah. And then I want to say, what, how much information does this quantum state have about this input? then I compute this formula. Right now, I'm just defining these four quantities. Okay. Now, how do I use it in analyzing this protocol? There is trouble. The trouble is, in classical, I could have defined something called a transcript. Yeah. But quantum operations destroy. That is, Bob took a message, applied a unitary, and produced a message. It is not possible for me to talk about the state. They are in different times. Yeah. So this is the time axis. Yeah. So I cannot write maybe something like the state of M1, M2. It's perfectly legitimate for me to say, what is the state of M2 at this point? What is the state of M1 at this point? But if I say state of M1, M2, the question is at what point? Yeah. And one cannot talk about the state of M1, M2 at this point. Now, 
I don't know how many of you are convinced or if somebody knows a better way of saying this, but this is a fundamental difficulty when we are in the quantum setting. Okay. So, no, message, this, that are, those are the quantums. Yeah. So imagine, yeah. So maybe I'll try to say, correct me if I'm wrong. A photo, you sent a photon, there was a two slit experiment or something. And then after doing several such experiments, the, you saw that the photon emerged out of the bottom slit. Can you say, or is it reasonable for you to record what trajectory the photon took? Yeah. Because if to know the trajectory you'll measure and then it's a different photon. Yeah. So considerations like this enter into the formulas that define quantum entropy and it becomes infeasible for us to declare a notion of a transcript as we would have liked to do if we were to just um, replicate the proof in the classical case. And it turns out, and we ought not to be able to prove, <laughs> replicate the proof in the classical case because in the quantum case, you can do this problem faster. Okay. So it turns out that what we do instead of the uh, trying to think of a transcript, we just consider the mutual information at all these individual time points and just add them up and work with this quantity. And once you work with this quantity, rest of the calculations work exactly the same. You don't need to know anything new. You just have to believe that whatever is true in classical works in quantum and Lieb has proved it. So and then question. You're making the measurement only at unitaries. You know the state at all stage, but um, question is which Hilbert space are you working on? Okay. So this is the Hilbert space of P spins. Yeah. Is, is there a joint Hilbert? So when, when we talk about probability here, sorry, in this case, if you really say, when I am trying to describe this transcript, in which probability space does it live? It lives in the product space of all this. Okay. Now, the corresponding thing, I cannot describe a single space in which the photon at time t1, time t2, t3, t4, like its entire state, like the fact that it took this trajectory, yeah, because there will be cancellations and destruction. I'll try and say it better later. Okay. But can I say that if I really wanted to know what M1 was, yeah. I would have needed to integrate over the remaining qubits in whose world lines are the first and third. That's right. You will have to trace these out. Yeah. So once I do that, I'll lose the information of the coherent state that will be. Yeah, that's right. But uh, we uh, I mean when we are doing in, in, in entropy, we are only talking about the uh -huh reduced density matrix of this and its mutual information with this. Okay. Yeah. So uh, doing <laughs> tracing out left and right is, I mean, is an occupational hazard here anyway. Okay. We cannot do this calculation without that. Okay. But uh, I don't think I've conveyed properly that difficulty, but maybe it will have to be done later. Okay. But um, now the end result is that you can show that any K round protocol for this problem, a quantum protocol has communication at least N over K squared. So if you allow more rounds, you can reduce the communication. This K squared is not optimal. You can do N over K, a lower bound of N over K, and that becomes optimal. Okay. All right. So basically, yeah. So in this case, again, the length of the message, the fact that these were long messages did not matter the amount of information they contained about this tiny bit is what counted. So it's the entropy that counts, not the length of the message. Okay, that was the me yeah, message of this argument. So let me summarize. Yeah, so now, uh, yeah, so the square root argument doesn't, yeah, so if this was N over K, suppose you were managed to prove N over K here. Okay. So if you have a K round protocol, then you have sent K bits anyway. Yeah. So if you do too few rounds, then this lower bound says N over K. And if you do too many rounds, anyway, the number of rounds is a lower bound on the number of bits. 
So you are balancing k and n over k, and that will get balanced at k equals square root. Okay, yeah. That is one way of seeing that. Yeah. This would just give you n to the one third, yeah, not square root n. Anyway, so what did I tell you? Yeah. So I told you about Shannon entropy and its application in counting. The first example, which was geometric, maybe was appealing. But believe me, the second example about random walks, number of possible walks, uh, sort of uh, exposes a different facet of how entropy enters into combinatorial calculations. Uh, I told you about repeated experiments and how the number of typical sequences grows as the number of experiments grows and that the exponent there is closely related to entropy. Um, I told you about communication complexity of Boolean functions. Uh, it's central to computer science. And it is not just for, compute, for communication problems. You can fit this communication, this, uh, communication complexity problem in many situations. And you can show lower bounds for various algorithms because they embed, there, there is embedded inside them a certain communication problem. It is more like a sub, an important lemma that is used in many applications in theoretical computer science. Then I told you about quantum communication and some of hand waved von Neumann entropy and its application for the very same problem. Next semester, uh, Avishek, uh, Sam and I will be teaching a course on quantum information. And many of these things hopefully will make more sense. There will be, you know, yeah, words of uh, learned length and thundering sound, fidelity, purification, strong subadditivity, monogamy of entanglement. Yeah. So all these things uh, you'll learn from them. And uh, entropy has applications uh, in many areas. And uh, I have not even scratched the surface. I want to give you one more example. About 10, more than 10 years ago, I picked up a newspaper and I found this jumble. Sam was mentioning something like this the other day at lunch. And uh, I was trying to look for the word here. And the puzzle says that there are seven letters and there is always a word which uses all seven letters. And I picked up the, I immediately saw poetry. And I was very happy. I put the paper away and I went to work. Then I realized that poetry doesn't have all seven letters. And I suffered and suffered and I came back home and I looked and looked for 15 minutes. And I found that the word was entropy. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, permit me to say uh, that uh, I was satisfied with poetry until I found entropy. Uh, because entropy, uh, poetry does not count. It's uh, entropy that counts. Yes. It's a binary string of n bits. Yeah. That's right. Actually, if you pick a random prime, a log n bit prime, and take the remainder of this number modulo p, yeah. and uh, the. What's the Oh, no, you get log n. You, you just need log n bit. So take the first n primes, pick one of the primes at random, and send, Alice sends Bob the prime, which is log n bits long, and also the remainder, this number, which is n bits long, you think of it as a binary, uh, binary encoding of an integer, which will be in the range 1 to 2 to the n, an n bit number. But you divide it, modulo that prime, and send the remainder. That is one protocol. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for staying till the end. Yeah. So, just a philosophical level. Why do you think entropy counts? <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I thought there was more, no more compelling example than this. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so the entropy counts by the very fact, I mean, in the combinatorial applications, let me just say this, the entropy formula, I mean, uh, has been defined, yeah, in such a way that when there is uniform distribution, it is log n, okay? And for every distribution, it is at most log n, all right? So if you want to show an upper bound, then the natural thing for you to do is to set up uniform distribution on the object of interest and somehow by hook or crook show that its entropy is small. This will give you an upper bound on the size of the set. If you want to show a lower bound, set up any distribution you want on this and show that its entropy is large. Yeah, It turns out that in the example about number of paths, we did not actually impose the right distribution. We just said, what is a convenient distribution for us to be able to, to evaluate the entropy formula? Now, all this looks like uh, you know, a matter of convenience and probably doesn't actually answer the question, why does entropy count? And I think the reason entropy counts in the end is the rate of growth of possibilities as you toss more and more, you perform the experiment again and again. Okay, and that number is closely related to entropy. I mean, it's, if you take divide by n, look at the exponent, the exponent is exactly entropy. And that counts, that counts the number of possibilities, essential possibilities. Questions? Yeah, so I don't know if there are people still, yeah, you have a question. So, yes, uh, last bit that you discussed, and just about what constituted the message, because you had these, uh, yeah, these three uh, thick lines. Yes. So, so yeah so what is so how does let us uh, just make up a quantum communication right now so i have a system uh, so alice has a system with uh, k spins and bob has a system with r spins they they start completely in zero 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 all spins are up yeah everywhere okay and now alice performs an operation unitary operation so then nothing gets destroyed or created this still R spins. Out of these, she sends off some M1 particles to Bob. So what does this operationally mean? Like of sending? She, yeah, does she trace out the rest of the spins and then the No, no. I mean, tracing out, etc. mathematicians do in their offices. Those particles exist. Yeah. She allows Bob access to those particles. She, he is now allowed to perform a unitary transform on this. But if Bob were to ask, what is the state of these particles? Of course, you will first write down this full state, trace out those. And if you want to do an analysis, it is tracing out. But Alice and Bob are in the lab doing engineering operations. They have no paper, nothing to do tracing out. Okay. Yeah. So there are some uh, registers, we call them. You can call them particles, certain spins. The ownership of these spins is handed over to Bob so that he is now entitled to perform a unitary transform. And if you send a large number of bits across, your message will be considered long. If you just send one, one of those spins over, then it's one bit of communication, one qubit of communication. So at no point in time until the very last step, either Alice or Bob see the spins. No, they coherently perform unitaries. The design of these unitaries they determined first by looking at the problem, they looked at the problem, they studied their quantum mechanics books and said this sequence of unitaries would be very great to apply, no matter what the input X and Y, I will get the answer, okay? Then when they receive an input X, based on the input X, they decide what this operation is going to be or what this operation is going to be. They keep performing these unitaries and in the end, the measurement happens. This one, that is the number, yeah, the number of spins that are transferred from Alice to Bob in the first round. Number of, so the dimension of, so if you are looking at its density matrix, if M1, then it is a two to the M1 cross two to the M. But what we really look for is the density matrix of this joint state, the information between what Bob possesses at this point and what Alice's input was at that point. Yeah. The information between Alice's input and the entire state that Bob has at this moment. Okay. Yeah. 
but this is just in our analysis. Sorry for going over time like this. But questions? You, they are completely free to do any unitary transform. Yeah, of course, in practical lab settings, only yeah, operations involving spins which are located far away will be infeasible. But this proof says that yeah, get your best quantum apparatus. You will not be able to do this without a total transfer of at least square root n spins over the entire life of the protocol. Yes. Thank you very much.